beautiful Facebook friends. Uh, I was just busy doing some um, work on the murder translation this morning and doing some editing and uh, correcting spelling mistakes and you know my, my Afrikaans mother tongue language sometimes um, does not always translate well in English so I have to look at my tenses and things and been busy with it for the past few months actually working through the entire uh, murder study bible which is now close to a thousand five hundred pages just making all those little corrections and then i get on to these um, and it's quite boring you know doing editing is really rather boring <laughs> but the holy spirit so exciting because often holy spirit distracts me in a little sentence that i have to just adjust or tweak or do something to and i was just looking um, amongst others this morning at luke chapter 24 again and um Realizing that so often it seems like a Jesus can just go absent on you, you know. <laughs> Here Luke interviews these two men on their way to Emmaus. And um, their faces are, are really showing the story, you know. They, their encounter of the most dramatic moment in the history on planet Earth, other than Genesis chapter 1, is now recorded in the drama around the arrest and the crucifixion and the uh, rumors of the resurrection of Jesus. And these two guys, they have obviously um, interpreted the entire drama as a negative story, you know, the, the, the one in whom they have so connected their trust for a better future for at least maybe a Christian political party you know where where the Sanhedrin will be kicked in the butt and Caesar would be dethroned and and my political party is gonna show who's boss <laughs> and here Jesus goes and dies on them and they are deeply discouraged and when Luke interviews them he mentions that they were on their way to Emmaus with their faces telling the story of how sad and disappointed they were. And while they were walking, Jesus himself drew near. But what is the use to have Jesus right next to you, right present in your situation, and you just don't recognize him? Because in your mind, you know, you've become so attached and so occupied to the contradiction. Your minds have become so, like they do, you know, they get so easily distracted into our interpretations, our little doctrines, our little ideas, and they just seem to not hold true to our expectation. And all along, Jesus walks right next to them and I'm so glad that Jesus didn't just tap them on the shoulder and say guys breathe deeply you know don't worry <laughs> I'm right here don't get your mind so caught up in the detail of your doctrines that you're trying to defend I'm right here you know what he did he took them on a journey through familiar scriptures, scriptures that they could relate to, scriptures that prompted and inspired their belief that somewhere on the horizon, in some unknown future moment, there would be an appearing of the Messiah, the great rescuer, that the God who created us made a promise and said he would interrupt our history, he would interrupt our situation, and be very present in the Messiah. And now the Messiah dies, and the Messiah is gone. And yet he told them, as John records in John chapter 14, he says, I will not abandon you. I will not leave you like orphans with just a fading memory of my presence 
I want to encourage you this morning. There are real times where, where life really just turns and throws a curved ball at you and you kind of feel, what, where's God in this? You know, what's happened to Jesus? What's happened to all these delightful promises? What's happened to those moments of ecstasy when we felt him so near, when we witnessed so much? And now this, you know, this kind of empty space that we're having to deal with that we're having to cope with, you know, this crisis, this, this, this grief, whatever it is that somehow interrupts and shuts down my, my mind to, to the reality of the nearness of the one who sustains all things by the word of his power, but he seems absent. What's the use of having a present God but he seems absent. <laughs> it is such an amazing time to remind ourselves that the same Jesus said, who said, I will not leave you as orphans. He says, it is to your advantage that I go. That somehow just doesn't make any sense. How could it possibly benefit me that he goes when I need him here? He says, because I'm going. And he's speaking in John 14 about what he's about to do. I'm going to the cross to bring closure to every possible accusation, to every idea that you could possibly have of an absent God. I'm going to bring closure to condemnation, to judgment, to any reference you could have of yourself, just not good enough, just not making the grade. I'm going to bring closure to that because he is the image of the invisible God. Do you know that God, Elohim, the creator of the universe, the creator of you, can never ever become invisible again? Because in flesh, in the incarnation, he stepped into our world. As he steps into your moment right now, whatever your time zone might be around this planet of ours. And he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. So Jesus says in John 14, when he tells them, I will not leave you as orphans. The next breath in him, in him introducing us to Holy Spirit, he says, I myself will come to you. And sadly, our theologians over the years have interpreted that verse as pointing to a second coming. That maybe, you know, his first coming just didn't do it, so there's going to be another appearance, another coming, and then he's going to just pull things straight. I want to surprise you today with the revelation of a nearness of Emmanuel that is closer to you than your breath, closer to you than your crisis, closer to you than the situation that just seems so impossible to solve. He is not more Emmanuel to the Jew than what he is to the Gentile. God is not more Emmanuel to the believer and the strong, big saints of God than poor little me, whoever I am, wherever you are on this planet. Emmanuel is equally Emmanuel to every part of your being. And in this place of discovering Emmanuel, we discover a, a brand new a reality that causes our hearts to ignite from within. So back to Luke chapter 24. Jesus himself draws near and he begins to communicate with these two guys who are so caught up in their own 
arguments. You know, the Greek literally, the Greek word means they were throwing words at one another. Do you know conversations like that? You know, you kind of get someone who agrees with you politically or whatever it is or economically and you, you kind of, you, you, you debate situations. It's almost like, like uh, social media or Facebook, you know, for that matter. We're throwing words at one another. You know, I, I mentioned something on my WhatsApp, one of my WhatsApp lists last week, you know, that, that, oh my goodness. Um, I'm not going to go into that detail right now, but I mean, really, there were some words thrown at me from people that I thought, really, they've walked with us for a while, they know the Mirror Bible, they know the thoughts, and, they, and suddenly, you know, you can, you, you just mention, for instance, the G, the gay word, and the, an explosion, you know, and suddenly everything is just back to, no, but the, uh, anyway, anyway, what I'm saying is that we get good at throwing words at one another, and uh, I remember years back in YWAM, I think it was Floyd McClung, um, that's, I'm talking about 1978, and uh, I once um, heard him say something so powerful, he said, you know, what's the use of winning an argument, but you're losing the person? <laughs> So when these two guys were in Luke chapter 24 throwing words at one another, you know, it was just really, um, uh, you know, trying to reinforce their, their disappointment. And the more you get into that conversation, the more the words are just, you know, making sense to my old mindset, you know, the, oh, yes, yeah, so this and that and the other. The, the, I kind of, you know, get, get, get reinforced in my disappointment. I kind of justify the fact that I'm feeling miserable. And um, so I'm looking for someone that I could call, perhaps, you know, that has, that's going through the same miserable situation. And, and then we kind of stir one another, you know, did you hear this? Did you see that? Did you? And on the latest news or whatever it was, you know, and, and it strengthens our our um, conviction that, that our party is better than your party or our situation or our beliefs or our doctrines or our ideas carries more weight than yours. And here they are caught up in this conversation that, that takes them nowhere. And Jesus begins to speak. And he reminds them in pointing to himself in Scripture. I know that uh, so many, with good reason, have walked away from the Bible a bit, you know. But don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. There is so much in Scripture, in the prophetic context, that holds true in the unveiled Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus who stepped into our world in skin, incarnate. God could not become more present in flesh than what it does in Jesus. And in Jesus' absence, God didn't go, well, let's all just sit back and wait now for another event somewhere in, you know, in the, whenever your dates could measure up to some future reference. He says, no. He says, I come. To abide with you. I myself, I will never leave you nor forsake you. When Paul writes about this, he uses living epistle language. He says, I'm speaking a living epistle language. You are known and read by all. God is more present in your skin than you could ever be in any theology or any doctrine that endorses an absent God. He's right there right now and he's gazing at you in this conversation to remind you of what it does when your heart ignites. Peter writes in, in one of his letters, he says, um, you will do well, Second Peter chapter 1. If you pay attention, he says, he, he reminds himself and reminds his audience of that day, remember, when just after he made that major confession in Matthew chapter 16, it is recorded where Jesus asked this big question, who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? And Peter says, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the one, you are the Son of the living God. And, and the next chapter, chapter 17 of Matthew, they're on this mountain of transfiguration. And Jesus' face begins to shine like the sun. And, 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 and 
Peter. I mean, the the the, the, the only people that Jesus, that Jesus took along was Peter and James, and here they are, the two illiterate guys, and he's got them with him on the mountain, and Elijah and Moses appears, and they've got this mountain top experience, and way later, you know, when Peter is close to to moving on, you know, he says. Um, God has shown me that my departure is near. And again, just like Paul, he, he doesn't see his departure as leaving us with a huge, massive gap. Paul wrote in said Philippians chapter 2, he says, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. So here Peter comes to that same conversation where Jesus said, it is to your advantage that I go. You know that the, 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 the absent the absence of the man Jesus Christ in the flesh, the absence of St. Paul, the absence of Peter, does not rob us of the presence of Emmanuel. Peter gives us a clue. He says, you will do well if you pay attention to this. And what, what's he talking about? He's talking about his experience there on the mountain. He says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power of his coming we heard the voice when God said this is my beloved son not Elijah or Moses but what Elijah and Moses represent in the prophetic and in the legal languages of the early Israel he says God has embroidered every word into a, a now reality in your in your being and he says you'll do well if you pay attention to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place so even this conversation might just be a little lamp shining in some dark place in your life situation right now. But pay attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Hold on to the little light. This little light of mine becomes a beaming new dawn of a new day. He says, until the morning star rises in your heart. And I pray right now that many of you are sitting out there in, in situations that you just feel you cannot cope with, that the morning star will rise in your own heart, that there will be a witness in your own heart, as in, in, in recorded here in Luke chapter 24, where, where these guys reflect on their conversation. They says, and they say, did not our hearts ignite within us while he was speaking to us? And while familiar old scriptures suddenly became brand new reality, to them in the face of their situation. There was a bigger situation arising within their hearts. And um, what blessed, blessed me so much this morning when I just read this again was that Luke takes them in his interview to a point where they relate how they arrived at their destiny. And they've now heard this conversation. They've now, their faces have even changed. Their faces began to light up. Their hearts were ignited within them. But Luke pushes them in his interview. He wants to get them to the point of where their actual encounter became so dynamic that they could not again fall back into their old reasoning. And this is the point I want to make in our little talk this morning. So often we've had great encounters. We've had a great moment of awakening. I've witnessed it over our years. People would sit there in tears and be absolutely enraptured with a word and they get so excited you know and, and I sometimes look at my old you know I've got 12 years of, of history on, on on Facebook sometimes even further back and, and people that just wow this word and and I go and where are they now you know what I mean some people just kind of go absent but I want you to know that Jesus didn't go absent on you he loves you he's right entwined with your very detail of every part of your being and of your life and it's in this in this moment of of his presence unveiled in your skin that life starts making sense in another dimension a dimension beyond where these little things that want to just pull you down into this mode where it kind of really feels that you're not going anywhere with this but come on it, 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 right there in Luke's interview, they arrive at their destiny. They're not going to go any further. They were on their way to home, you know, in Emmaus. It was eight miles walking distance in the evening. And, and, and now they get to that point. And Luke brings in this little detail. And this detail is so important for you to hear. He writes in verse, let me just get to that verse again. My screen has gone absent on me. Let me quickly just mirror mirror opens the screen there we go 
um, it says here, I'm reading to you verse 28. I'll read you from verse 27, Luke 24, verse 27. He then, this is now Jesus, uh, took them on a journey. Maybe I must just read the passage to you. I'll read you from verse 16, Luke chapter 24. Just, just hang in there. You're going to enjoy this. It says here, Later that same day, Luke 24 verse 13, Later that same day, Two of the disciples were walking to Emmaus, about eight miles from Jerusalem. They were in deep discussion about all the things they had witnessed. Verse 15, in the middle of their debating, groping for answers, Jesus joined them on their journey. Wow. <laughs> verse, 20, verse 16, how many, you could imagine verse 15, the whole chapter could end there. Jesus joined them. So, wow, Jesus, is, why, do, why would, you know, it just kind of cancels all the debates. Now listen to this. Verse 16, Yet their eyes were veiled and they did not recognize him. Do you see that our conversation can either veil our minds and our eyes or unveil our minds and our eyes. There's a veiling and an unveiling. Thank God. Why are you so perplexed? Jesus asks them in verse 17. You're throwing words at one another and judging by your gloomy faces, it's obviously not helping. Verse 18, and one of them, Cleopas, answered him, Are you living in isolation, not knowing what has taken place right here in Jerusalem over the past few days? Don't you read the newspapers, you know? I mean, are you not? You've got to be up. Sometimes, you know, you know, you be, you know so many wonderful people, but often, you know, people's conversation gets so stuck in the latest news. Have you heard the news? Have you read today's newspaper? Have you at least, you know, watched the headlines? Come on, you know, you want, I, I, I'm not saying just, you, if you don't read, we live in a very remote area, so we don't read headlines really, but we hear about it, you know, people talk about it and it happens and it pops up, but don't get your mind dictated and blocked by the latest headline. If you want to go on a fear trip, on a horror journey, then at least feed on every little bit of uh, gossip that you can gather, but it's not good for you, there's something better. He says to them, uh, they say to him, are you a stranger um, taking place here in Jerusalem over the past few days? Uh, okay, I'm not going to read you. Oh, well, it, it is, it's interesting. I say in a marginal note in Codex 5 from the 9th century, it says that Nathaniel was uh, with Cleopas, a cousin of Jesus. This is also confirmed in the great Epiphany. Epiphanius in his, but okay, so it was but most probably Nathaniel. <laughs> the beautiful things to be said about that. I think I wrote an entire chapter on that reference on Nathaniel and Cleopas. But anyway, verse 20, verse 19, chapter 24. Jesus replied, so what exactly happened? They both answered, there's such wisdom in Jesus. They both answered, the man Jesus of Nazareth was a prophet was known for his mighty works and works works and words before God and all people. And as I see my extended notes and John 1 45 46 in the extended notes at the end of this chapter on Nathaniel. Okay, verse 20. Well, the high priests and our rulers betrayed him and sentenced him to death, then crucified him. We had such high hopes that he was about to redeem Israel. Yet now, it is already the third day since it all happened. And uh, I want to just emphasize the fact that often our high hopes can lead to great disappointment. And many, many, even in the evangelical world, even in the grace world, have had high hopes stirred to some great through some great preaching to some great anointed prophetic thoughts and words that were spoken over your life and your high hopes seem to just just go floating somewhere and there's no substance to it but there's a substance to the hope 
that is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 now faith is the substance to things hoped for the evidence of things not seen if Jesus is that reality of what faith holds and unveils Jesus is the very substance of every dream you could ever hope for he exceeds your dreams that's why Paul prays in Ephesians 3 verse 20 that exceedingly abundantly above he uses all these superlatives to bring our minds to rescue our minds out of this bonsai world where you feel so trapped and so confined he says exceedingly abundantly above all things that you could even imagine. You see what God accomplished in Christ includes your most dramatic, most severe, most terrible onslaught of contradiction. He has brought you into a wide open space and he's about to bring these guys into this wide open space. So we had such high hopes. Now it's already the third day. Jesus just lets them talk and and then they say, in the meantime, some of the women in our group astounded us. They were at the tomb very early this morning. His body wasn't there. Then they claimed to have seen a vision of two angels who said that he was alive. Some of our own group then also went to the tomb and found the grave empty, just as the woman told us, but they did not see Jesus. It's amazing how our... Us, uh, our um, are wanting to see Jesus. You know, we hear the most amazing testimonies. We hear the most amazing accounts. Oh, but we we, we kind of we, we we slotted back. That's why we're in such a bad mood. You know, because we slotted back into the goosebumps are gone. You know, I just don't feel like I did last night. Or I feel the you know felt that anointing. Or I felt that moment of conviction. But it just doesn't feel like that for long. You know, you've got to just kind of get back to to real normal life. You know, just back on planet Earth. I've got some wonderful chapters in, in, in my commentary notes in the Mirror Bible. Uh, maybe one that I'm just thinking of now is the, the one in, at the end of Revelation chapter 16 where you speak about the, uh, uh, the, the Armageddon and uh, the, yeah, anyway, I, 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 I don't want to get too distracted otherwise we'll just get stuck here for a while. Let's just, let's just move on here. Hebrew, uh, I'm still in Luke chapter 24. Um, Jesus starts speaking and he says in verse 25, now remember Jesus is not in their minds the risen one. Jesus is just a stranger. Sometimes, you know, just strange things can happen to us, but it's good to have open ears. So here Jesus says to them, why do you fail to understand and find it so difficult to believe the entire context of the prophetic conversation was there talking about the prophets was their theme not always pointing to the inevitable sufferings of the Christ and the subsequent glory and I've got wonderful extended notes in 1 Peter 1 verse 10 and 11 on that subject the theme of the prophetic word. If you want to study the prophetic word, I've just recently also updated um, my commentary on the prophetic word in, in 1 Corinthians 14. On the latest editions, it will be, um, 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 uh, it, it is there. Also on the latest edition that I did on the 10th um, edition of the one, one volume book, and then on obviously on all the three volume books. But it's, it's exciting. Verse 27 of 24. Okay, so the theme of the prophetic word was the sufferings of the Christ and the subsequent glory. You see, if we walk away from the sufferings of the Christ and the subsequent glory, we're walking away from the very prophetic key that unlocks the understanding. And this is why Jesus didn't just tap them on the shoulder. He wanted to take them through the prophetic word because there was much more weight in words that were spoken and was, was, was carried through oral, the oral tradition for centuries. And the theme of that conversation was that the, the Christ, the Messiah, the rescuer of the human situation, the rescuer of the human race, the rescuer of the image and likeness of Elohim clothed in your skin. This rescuer was to suffer and out of his sufferings there would be birthed glory, subsequent 
glory. And you know what Isaiah says about this glory? Isaiah chapter 40. He says in verse 5, All flesh shall see His glory together. Do you know that you are a glory carrier? The very glory of God is carried in your skin. And he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18, the theme of the mirror translation, he says that uh, um, with unveiled faces we are beholding, we are gazing at the glory of God as in a mirror. Do you see the mirror brings the glory of God home. The glory of God is no, some, no longer some beautiful theoretical uh, uh, eloquent picture of of a god as somewhere in the heavens but god at home in your skin elohim emmanuel the oneness that jesus came to unveil he says i and the father we are one you've seen me you've seen the father and in that same chapter of john chapter 14 he says i'm introducing you to holy spirit the paracletos is i'm introducing to you to him in the same context that you will see holy spirit if you see the father in one and you will know even as you've always been known right let's just continue here he then took them on a journey this is so beautiful verse 27 people ask me when will you do the old testament in the mirror bible i say you know i don't think I, i'm going to get time ever to, to to do maybe one or two three chapters i don't know in in the old testament maybe they had the first three chapters in genesis or one or two psalms so we'll see we'll see how go things go along but if you are familiar with the mirror bible Almost every page has a reference to this conversation of Jesus because it's the prophetic word that is inseparably linked and entwined with the unveiled incarnate word. You cannot, you know, discard the prophetic word in, and, uh, uh, and, and say, well, it doesn't matter. The prophetic word obviously fulfills a function and his function just like the placenta was to bring the child into this flesh into this word, word into this world but it's wonderful to understand that the the prophetic word was pregnant pregnant with a messiah and it's that specific word that makes sense and that we give our attention to don't waste time with words that do not line up with the father who, of jesus christ who is revealed in flesh Colossians 1 um, 15 says that he is the image of the invisible God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Any idea theologically or whatever we have of God that is unlike Jesus isn't God. So here we go. So they were now getting close to the village. He took them on a journey through scripture, beginning with Moses and throughout the prophets. He pointed to himself mirrored in their word. They were now getting close to the village they were heading for. And here's the sentence I wanted to draw your attention to. But he appeared to be going further. I love it that Luke could capture that kind of detail in this interview. When they got to the village, Luke wants to know, he says, it slows them down. There's now Cleopas and Nathaniel. He says, guys, slow down. What, 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 just, just, just tell them. What happened at that point? Well, it appeared that he was going further. I wrote there, I so love Luke's attention to detail in this interview. He obviously prompts them to tell him, exa tell, to tell him exactly at which point they actually recognized this learned stranger who accompanied them. Okay, so he appears to be going further, but they would have nothing of it. They told him forcefully and as politely as possible to spend the night at their dwelling. It was already evening and a late hour. He obliged and entered the village, the, the village with them because they were just at the end, in, entrance to the village. This is how it happened. As soon as they reclined at table, he took the bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. My goodness. They, they, they reclined at the table not to have communion. They are three exhausted travelers they've they've walked a long while you know and they've they've had to emotionally carry much with them and here they're sitting at the table these two jews having the stranger with him they they were polite and forceful they said no no you know we've enjoyed your conversation our hearts are on fire i mean yeah jesus has two red hot candidates you know maybe he's going to sneak in a little altar call a little say after me sinner's prayer or something but he's got these hot candidates you know they should they should just now be Come part of the club. And so he appears to be going further. Because it's in the moment where it appears that he's going absent or where he feels absent that becomes a key moment in your fresh 
encounter of not just what was spoken in the prophetic word, but in your next meal, as you just sit around the table, as you feed your face, as you just do the most wonderful thing, you know, that we do daily, you know, we just, we just get hungry. And suddenly, you know, we've eaten our full yesterday. Last night we thought, oh, I'm not going to eat again for two days. I've had so much to eat. And the next meal becomes such a moment for us to recognize that, hey, I don't have to study biology to discover how digestive my digestive system works. I, I smell the food and the enzymes in my mouth begins to be alerted, you know, there's food coming and my mouth's watering and I, my goodness, I'm hungry. Let's eat. And as we eat and feed our face, we, we do it kind of, you know, talking about the latest news and nonsense and all kinds of junk. Which kind of, but, you know, feasting around the table, even if it's just, just a, a simple meal, is an opportunity for you to rediscover an absent Jesus. Your next meal becomes an opportunity to realize that there's something about eating daily. Jesus says, as often as you do this. And we made it as we do communion. No, 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 no. Every time you eat or drink becomes such a key opportunity for you to remember that the word becomes flesh. Food becomes flesh. Thoughts that I think become incarnate in my mind. So when I eat and he breaks the bread, I suddenly realize that just like my heart became on fire because of words that never made sense, that suddenly slot into place. So my body is nourished. Life is nourished in this meal. Let's read on here. Um, And my commentary note, I said, and proceeded to give it. Epididu. It's a very beautiful use of the Greek imperfect active. Now, the word imperfect means this is continuing on. It's not stopping here. Indicating that while he was in the act of distributing, they recognized him. He blessed and having broken. Um, let me just make this a little bit bigger. He blessed and having broken was giving it to them when in an instant their eyes were opened. That's the aorist um, That's commentary by Vincent. Here Jesus had two red hot candidates. She did not at this point have given them an opportunity to make a commitment or at least say a sinner's prayer. Verse 31. And immediately their eyes were opened and they knew exactly who he was. Then he vanished from their sight. Isn't that something? I mean just a few verses ago. When Luke's interviewing them, they, they, they were getting close to the village they were heading for, but he appeared to be going further. And now he's vanished. He's gone. But what happened in between? You see, it's so important for us to realize this because I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to, to help you in a situation where you might be at right now, where Jesus just feels far away. He's gone. God's absent. You know, I just don't see him or feel him at all. Reflect on a prophetic word that carries far more weight than your brief history on planet earth, than the very brief history of your problem. Sometimes we give our history, our problem, our situation far too much credit. If we can just zoom out into the bigger picture of a history that carries more weight than any negative history of humanity could ever carry. There's a history, uh, his story, that, is, th that has interrupted human space. Like that first day in Genesis when this, this earth was void. It was, it was a rough space. And the invisible God became most visible for the first time in the history of the universe on the stage of planet earth and he's come in Christ to rescue and redeem the presence the presence of God in you in your roughness in your rough place in the spots where you feel but God cannot be present there he says in 
the mouth of David the prophet. He says, even in, if I make my bed in hell, in Hades, in this dark place, behold, I am there. There is no place where God can be absent. There is no place where I am is not. And immediately their eyes were opened. And they knew exactly who he was. Then he vanished from view. They erupted in an avalanche of words. This is Luke 24, 32 in the Mirror Bible. They erupted in an avalanche of words. Were our hearts not set ablaze? Even while he was speaking along the way and opening the scriptures to us. Okay, so in the commentary note. Um, I just mentioned um, Vincent, one of the commentators, he has a lovely thing to say. He says, the authorized version, as usual, pays no attention to the graphic imperfect tenses here. They are speaking of something which was in progress. Was not our hearts burning infinite verb and participle while he was speaking and was opening the scriptures? There's such beautiful continuation in this Oh, thank God. And then I got a little added a little commentary. It says Luke was intrigued by the fact that they did not recognize Jesus, even though their hearts already ignited with resonance while he was pointing to himself in Scripture, explaining the prof prophetic promise of mankind's redemption from Moses through Psalms, Psalms and the prophets. Jesus could easily have just tapped them on the shoulder at the beginning of their journey and immediately tell them who he was, but he reveals himself in their familiar language, the scriptures, knowing, he's speaking to the Jews here, knowing that the entire context of the incarnation is grounded in these profound prophetic writings. Also, this beats any sinner's prayer or even an angelic visitation, hands down. It pleased the Father, says Paul in Colossians 1.27. I'm just finishing with this. It pleased the Father. Paul later recalls to unveil his son in me. The fire now kindled in their hearts would become a mirror encounter where the mystery that was hidden for ages and generations would explode within them. They took off immediately and rushed back to Jerusalem to tell the others. There they found the eleven together with everyone else, with everyone else who themselves were overflowing with news. They were babbling non-stop. The Lord is certainly risen. And he appeared to Simon. And so it continues. And the point I'm closing with is just that to, to underline that no matter what your situation is, don't find a conversation that locks you in that situation. So often we go for a little pity party you know, to someone who's gone through a similar situation, we sit there and we kind of share our negative stories until we have um, found enough confirmation to stretch out our own story. There is another conversation. And it's that conversation that we are invited to. And you know, when you engage with the conversation of His presence, you become that conversation. You become that living epistle known and read by all. And it doesn't mean that you just always show up with a smile on your dial. You weep for them that weep. But you don't weep in a hopeless way. You weep knowing that the integrity the legitimacy of humankind's salvation cannot be compromised. My doubts, my fears, my hang-ups doesn't have what it takes. There's a greater reality. And the greater reality is your reality. It's tailor-made for you in your situation. Yes, says Isaiah in chapter 60, darkness shall cover the earth. And then it gets worse, he says, and thick darkness, the people. And one would expect the next sentence to read, 
run and hide. <laughs> the next sentence says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. My light? Yes, the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. A nation shall come to your light, and they lead us to the brightness of your rising. I want to encourage you to engage with the light of life. In your light do we see the light. Don't seek light anywhere else. In your light do we see the light. And Paul testifies of this in Second Corinthians chapter 4. He says, the God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Remember, light shone before the sun. We let light shine out of darkness is the God who shone into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And that's in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. He closes chapter 3. Well, he didn't write in chapters, but the sentence is just four or five verses before this verse is that now with unveiled faces we are beholding and gazing at the glory of God as in a mirror. He says it's the God who said that light shine of darkness darkness who shone into our hearts to give the light of the glory of God in the face of a man. The glory of God was always meant to find its most tangible most accurate expression in the face of a man in your face in your face we're holding up the mirror so that you may gaze and recognize the features of the invisible God made very visible in your face in your situation in the midst of whatever it is that you are facing so that every question mark becomes an exclamation mark the rough places made smooth, the highway built in the wilderness. I thank you, Jesus, for this moment of light and life recognized as in a mirror.